Hark the bardic paladin who sings and plays again. He tells the tales of glory and weaves a magic story. He'll join you at your table and ask you to share a fable. Heroes of humble origin, villains who must be fought again. No matter their skill or prowess, the people in life are countless. So we pray you heed our request. Enjoy this tale of sidekicks and sidequests. Sidequests and sidequests and sidequests. Episode 37, Cedril, the Rakshasa Taxidermist. Welcome to Sidekicks and Sidequests, the Dungeons and Dragons podcast that helps to put humans back into humanity and breathe life into your campaign NPCs with backstory and bravado. That's right, we're building a world, one character at a time. I am your host, Kurt Krenwelge, the Bardic Paladin, and I'll be joining Kenneth Vigue's table in the Levitating Platter. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another exciting episode of Sidekicks and Side Quests, the coolest D&D unofficial podcast, in my biased opinion. I am joined by a fantastic creator out there in the community of Fallout, and I was so happy and so gracious that he decided to accept my invitation. We were able to interview three of his cast members, and now we finally got him. So uh, why don't I turn the mic over and ask for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, I am Kenneth Figue. I'm the writer, producer, editor, actor, marketer, all about person from Chad, a Fallout 76 story, which is my first podcast ever and first audio production of any kind ever. And the first thing I've written in 10 years. That's pretty cool. This is my second podcast. And to be able to put up the numbers that you're putting up is a dream of mine one day, one day. Yeah, it just kind of happened. And I think part of it comes down to finding the right muse. There's a combination of inspiration and also timeliness. Our fandom, as far as Fallout goes, has somewhat of a void for storytelling outside of the game environment. There are a few podcasts out there that have come and gone over the years that have told stories kind of in the heart of mine where they've created characters in their own world, but they're mostly relegated to add-on mods which some of the scripted ones that you get in previous games are really well written, but we don't have a lot of stories to go on in the Fallout world. So that's a space I wanted to try and fill. Yeah, and I think you've done quite well. I first heard of you when Bethesda started making the game days announcements that you guys were going to be doing a live recording. And I said, oh, why don't I just put on this podcast and see what it's all about? And the minute that the intro started, I guess that really cool rockabilly sort of a lone wanderer vibe that you guys picked up. That's where you hooked me. I was (laughs) like, oh, if you have good music, then I'm going to stick around and listen. And then, of course, all the writing and the dialogue and the characters that you've created on that show have been great. Thank you. It's been a joy to follow along the misadventures of my fellow vault residents in Appalachia. It has a weird sound to it. I grew up listening to a lot of vintage radio, like classic radio horror stories from the 1940s and 50s, Lights Out, The Weird Circle, and all of those kind of stories on vinyl. And I think there's some elements of that, but I also wanted to make it a little bit more modern in terms of its humor and approachability. Right. In a generation where toilet humor paired with psychology and even Taoism, it's kind of this weird hodgepodge of a bunch of different things that kind of came together. So before you and I both nerd out about Fallout too much and turn this into a Fallout podcast rather than a Dungeons and Dragons podcast, I have to ask, do you currently or have you ever played Dungeons and Dragons? Never, ever. Is it something that you've been interested in trying? Not really. For the most part, beyond stage acting, I never got into role play of of any kind. That being said, I've always enjoyed role play video games. I just never translated that into something else. And part of it could be growing up, I didn't have that experience. A lot of my friends did end up playing Dungeons and Dragons and stuff. My group 
we did, I don't know, just a bunch of other stuff. <laughs> I think in the 80s, uh, we spent a lot more time riding around on huffy bikes looking for adventures than anything else. I see. Living a Goonies life. Yeah, very Goonies. Well, since this show is called Sidekicks and Sidequests, we like to ask our guests this first one. Do you have a favorite NPC from an RPG or video game, etc.? And why are they your favorite NPC sidekick? Oh, that's an easy one to answer. Robert Edwin House from Fallout New Vegas is one of my favorite characters of all time. Why is Mr. House your favorite? He embodied and shaped the Fallout world in so many different ways, the technology, the evolution of that world. And when you finally meet him in New Vegas, he's kind of cannibalized himself into a computer, but he still has a very clearly defined vision of how to fix the world. And if you end up siding with a few other factions in the game and decide to kill him, it's a little unfortunate because he could have been the, the best prepared person to repair the world. His genius was counterbalanced by almost this aloof, casual understanding of people. And yet he is very complimentary and appreciative of your skills as a lieutenant in getting things done and rewards you handsomely and to a degree would listen to you on your advice. He wasn't micromanaging you. I know in my playthrough of Fallout New Vegas, I unfortunately did off Mr. House, but I do know there's certain challenges or achievements you can get. Like, for instance, if you kill House with a golf club, that's a direct allusion to the video game <laughs> Bioshock. <laughs> yes. Because I think they modeled Mr. House a little bit off of Andrew Ryan from that game, if I'm not mistaken. I think it was a little bit of him. Yeah, visually. You're absolutely right about the character of Mr. House being instrumental to shaping of the fallout universe especially with the wastelanders update we had with fallout we can see even a little bit of influence that house has had in that region of the united states as well yeah without giving away spoilers <laughs> this far out so much of what mr house was was based on howard hughes and there are a ton of easter eggs and the inspiration that shaped him from howard hughes's life living in the casino who he ran around with his fear of germs a whole bunch of stuff so as we head to the next question, what is your favorite side quest from an RPG or a video game, etc.? And why is it your favorite side quest? Oh, that's a tough question. I think with this one, I would have to say when you get a chance in Fallout New Vegas to head off and check out the Helios platform, you end up activating that. And you have a decision at that point in time to channel the power directly to the strip, channel it to the surrounding areas and kind of help the people who aren't elite enough in the strip. Or you could simply arm this ancient pre-war weapon... <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. You and just find her. rain down holy hell. I liked that particular side quest for a number of reasons. One, the old school tech of it, the starting up sequence gives you goosebumps. The sound effects that they used for that, the monotone female voice announcing that it was arming itself and getting ready to fire was a very cool sequence. But it also, you had to decide right then and there what kind of a person you were going to be. It's a defining moment for the character where you decide that are you going to allow yourself to be corrupted by this pre-war mentality of just destroying anything in your way and live this kind of warmongering life? Or are you going to give power freely? Or are you going to be the kind of person who gives power to the powerful and keeps it that way? It's kind of an interesting and defining path. It was just one of my favorites. I love that kind of OP pre-war tech. Anytime you can play with it or even experience it where you're, you've got, you're chasing behind Liberty Prime as he's stomping through the Capitol Wasteland and Fallout 3. Those kind of sequences are just awesome. And as we head into the last question then for the personal interview section, what are you passionate about and why? Telling stories, not just with the stories that I write as far as the podcast, but in my real world job, I run a marketing firm. And so much of what we do is to help brands and companies define their story. And it doesn't matter what they're trying to talk about, if it's a product or a category, or in some instances, it's people who are developing a personal brand where they're trying to define themselves as an influencer or even the head of a company where they have a story. But oftentimes, because you're in your own head, you need an outside element to kind of help you put into focus what your story really is. 
I think most of us, unless you're a severe narcissist, just kind of go about our lives and don't think we're that remarkable. But nonetheless, some of the actions that we do are remarkable. We just forget to tell those stories or are too humble to want to tell them. But I think defining some of those stories and shaping them and getting them out there is something that I really enjoy doing. All right. Well, I think we've learned a fair amount about our guest here, and this would be the perfect segue to head into NPC creation. Alright, so this is the part of the show now where we get to make up an NPC. And I think before the show, we confirmed that you were going to roll randomly for characters. Is that correct? I'm going to go random. Okay, awesome. And you have your virtual dice at the ready? I do. Would you like me to have one dice or two dice? Well, we're going to be switching around different dice types today. Okay. So... For the first question of determining our character's name, why don't you go ahead and pull out one of the D20s there and give a roll on that? Okay, yep, I got one here. All right, so okay. one dice, 20-sided. I'm going to roll mm-hmm. it. Roll once. Yes, sir. Here we go. All right, I rolled a 15. 15. Okay, so this name was submitted by our previous guest, Elise Basili, and the name we're working with is Cedril. C-E-D-R-I-L. Cedril. Let's go ahead and figure out what is going to be the ancestry of Cedril. That would be D100. I rolled a 27. 27. Oh, wow. Okay. We have another Rakshasa. Basically, think of like a tiger, like humanoid, but it's a devilish creature and the hands are backwards. So like your right hand's on your left arm and your left hand's on your right arm. They're a classic D&D monster. So, okay. Cedril. Rakshasa. Okay. What is their job or role in society? Let's go ahead and roll a D8. I got a seven. Lucky seven. Okay. This response was submitted by our guest, Brady Effler, taxidermist. So, Cedril, the Rakshasa, taxidermist. With hands like these, you should see what I can do with dead animals. (laughs) And let's see. Now we're going to get a regular D10, and we're going to figure out what age range that this character is in three okay this came up with child so a childlike age for the creature and since she's a devil or you know a devilish creature maybe it doesn't necessarily mean the same but a fairly young rakshasa that is a taxidermist okay i feel like my obsession with dead animals is probably going to be problematic in my adulthood but we'll go with it okay (laughs) well now we get to take a little bit of a break from rolling the dice and now is an opportunity for you with inspiration to describe Cedril's physical appearance. Well, let me see. If he's childlike, he has an irritatingly long tail that he constantly trips over and that has a life of its own. So he's always kind of batting it out of the way. His legs are a little too long. And because his hands are kind of a little bit all over the place, he's always trying to stuff them in his pockets because he's a little ashamed of how weird they look in comparison to the average person. Hmm, interesting. And then you would figure like a normal visage for a Rakshasa, not anything distinctive otherwise. Except he likes to wear a monocle. Probably is very good for looking up close as he's working on reassembling the taxidermy animals. That's what I figured. It would be one of those steampunky ones with the glasses that have multiple lenses. You could just kind of flip it down. Oh, that's cool. I like that. Okay, so now as we have this picture in our mind, what three adjectives describe Cedril? Skittish, intelligent, sarcastic. All right, now we get to go back to rolling dice. So now we have to determine what valuable item or piece of lore, a secret, or maybe even an ideal or concept that he subscribes to is. So let's go ahead and roll a four-sided dice to figure out which of those categories it's going to be. I got a three. Okay, so that would be a secret. So now why don't you go ahead and roll a regular six-sided dice so we can figure out what is going to be the secret that Cedril has. Ooh, I rolled a six. Six! So this one says that he was witness to an unsolved murder and hasn't revealed the information yet. Interesting. And then finally, the last thing that we get to roll a dice for is going to be a particular side quest that Cedril would need player characters to go and do. So why don't you go ahead and roll one of the 12-sided dice? I rolled a 7. Okay, interesting. So this one is deliver a love letter. You sure this is Dungeons and Dragons and not Skyrim? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, I'm sure. If anything, Skyrim borrows from Dungeons and Dragons. Oh, absolutely. 
as we're thinking about this particular side quest, well, first off, what are the circumstances surrounding this love letter for this particular taxidermist who is a witness to a murder but hasn't told anyone yet? So figure out all those and then figure out, okay, they deliver this letter. What's the reward for that? And then the flip side of they fail to deliver the letter or they don't even take the side quest. What's going to be the consequence? Oh, dear. All right, let's see. Maybe a question to help clarify, because even though Rakshasas do live in the hell dimensions, they have the ability to shapeshift, and so they're able to blend in with other humanoid cultures. So I'm wondering, is this particular Rakshasa, does he live in the normal mundane world among humans and dwarves and elves, or does he live in hell, and he just looks like a regular Rakshasa, and he's taxiderming, like, corpses or something like that? Yeah, no, he was definitely run out of hell for his interest in taxidermy while everyone was busy harvesting souls and responding to cultists at shrines. So Cedril lives in the mundane world and he more than likely takes on an otherwise human form, I guess. Yeah, which could be draining at times. And while he's intelligent, he's not skilled in maybe some traditional ways that Rakshasas would be. So he isn't able to properly cloak everything. So period Periodically, his tail will just kind of pop out of his pants. Oh, there you go. And he has to keep hiding his hands because they'll keep switching from left to right. Keeps tucking them back into a pocket. It makes it very awkward for him to be in public. Very self-conscious. So he keeps to his shop probably a lot of the times, rarely ventures out and stuff. Yeah, yep. So then what's the deal with his love letter then that he's... Obviously, he's a recluse, but he's attracted to someone and he wants the heroes to go deliver this letter. Well, even the most awkward people have to have a friend. So his best friend, who is a local hunter, they will go out on hunts together to try and find the best prey to stock his taxidermy shop with. So when going out on a hunt one day, his friend is lamenting, trying to get the attention of a particular maiden. So Cedril comes up with a clever plan. And while his hunter friend is not intelligent in the least and cannot write, he decides to pen a love letter for him Okay, and intends on getting it to the maiden in a discreet way without telling his friend who's too proud to ask for help with something like that. So then what is going to be the reward? The reward wouldn't necessarily be something concrete. I think his friend would find out after the maiden (laughs) responds to him and he doesn't understand her sudden change of heart or noticing him. And eventually she lets slip that she absolutely loved the poetry that he wrote for her. At that point, he realized what his friend did, goes back, confronts his friend who realizes he was just doing it to help out. So the hunter uses a magical object that he's been holding onto that has sentimental value for him but what little magic is left he gives it to Cedril who is then able to perfect his ability to cloak himself oh interesting so one good turn deserves another so the reward of the side quest is actually helping the NPC themselves okay without realizing it was going to end that way he did it because he cares about his friend so then as far as the relationship between Cedril and the player characters there's no immediate award there other than oh thank you so much I did it for my friend and they get the warm fuzzies. Yep. This is an interesting one. I know I usually like to be like, well, make a proviso in there in the event that your player characters are like, oh, we want money or something like that. Does that seem fair to you? Or mainly you think it would be more of, oh, you help me and that improves our business relationship. So maybe going forward in the future, if you want to buy taxidermy products from me, I'm willing to give you a discount or something like that. There would have to be something special about the taxidermy product. Maybe Cedril's ability is whatever he freezes in time in death can be deployed in battle. So if you purchase some kind of a taxidermy something that has the ability to come to life when a player needs it. That is interesting. I don't think I've heard that one, but certainly because he's a Rakshasa, he has access to these powers. I don't see why not that he could put a little bit of devilish magic in them. And if you speak the right words, your taxidermied animal will come to life and be able to help you in battle. And then I guess once it reaches zero hit points, it just reverts to a regular taxidermy 
taxidermied animal. So maybe it's like a one-time use thing, or do you think it's multiple uses? No, I think it'd be a one-time use thing, because otherwise I think it would be a little too overpowered. Okay, but that's interesting. So, okay, so he has magical taxidermied animals that when you use the right incantation, then those animals come to life and they will be allied to you and you can use them however long you need them. Do you think there's a time limit on how long the magic works for, or is it they're just a normal animal until they reach zero hit points and then they turn back into a taxidermied animal? Yeah, I think until they reach zero hit points and then they just revert back. In my head, I can envision a group of heroes doing this and they grow really attached to the animal. And they're like, no, 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 we can never use this animal. It can never get to zero hit points. I don't want it to turn back into a taxidermied owl or whatever. What an emotional moment. (laughs) It comes to your aid and dies like old yeller. And then it just like freezes hollow in place back in its taxidermy form. No! Oh, that's so good. All right, well, now we need to think of the flip-flop. What's going to happen as a result of failure? Players fail to deliver the letter to the right person, or they refuse him. What's going to be either of those consequences? Well, an interesting consequence would be if it doesn't actually get to the maiden, and instead it ends up in the hands of someone nefarious. Like, let's say her father isn't a big fan of the hunter in general. Maybe they've quarreled in the past. So the father gets a hold of the letter instead or finds it if you deliver it to the wrong spot and she doesn't get it first. The net result of that is a huge to-do between the father and the hunter, kicking him out of the forest on his land and stopping his ability to hunt. Oh, wow. So economic repercussions then for failing to deliver the letter in the proper spot, which I'm sure is also going to affect Cedril's business as well, because he's not going to have any more animals that he's going to be able to taxidermy, or he's going to have to go to wilder and more dangerous parts in order to get fresh animal corpses. Yeah, there's a lot riding on this letter here. (laughs) Okay, wow. No, that's good stakes. If the player characters don't want to deliver the letter, is there a different sort of consequence to that? Is it going to force Cedral to have to leave the shop and risk being discovered and lynched or something like that? I think it would because he, over time, would maybe lose his ability to cloak himself effectively. So the net result was Cedril ends up getting run out of town, loses his friendship, and becomes increasingly more jaded to maybe go evil. Full evil. Full evil. So by not delivering this love letter, you actually end up creating a villain. This is some butterfly effect stuff here. You'd better deliver that letter. (laughs) This sounds like a great NPC, and I think it deserves some exploration. So why don't we head into a random encounter? So now this next segment of the show is where we get to have a short roleplay exercise. So since we fully fleshed out Cedril, we'll have you, Mr. Vigiu, take the role of Cedril, the taxidermist, and I will be someone else entering the scene. I think in this particular instance, I think my good boy, good hero adventurer character, Duncan, would be the perfect NPC to come into a shop and interact with him. Okay. So at this point then, so you're coming in and I'm going to tap ask you with getting the letter to the maiden? Precisely. Okay. Duncan, having finished his last adventure in the Underdark, reemerges on the surface, fully fresh and revitalized. He enters the town, looks over on the signpost of this one particular small shop, and it has a little stuffed rabbit hanging from the sign. And so he goes, oh, this looks interesting. And so he'll open the door, cha-ching, ching and he takes a look around the shop. And what does he see on the inside of the shop? So at this point, Cedril is having a conversation with his friend, the hunter, and the hunter is lamenting about the maiden, how much he loves her, how much he's infatuated with her, but it's never to be. He doesn't think he's good enough for her. So Cedril, meanwhile, while he's working away on some kind of a creature, setting it up on a new frame, is hatching a plan in his mind to help his friend out. At which point the hunter leaves, says hello and goodbye to you, and it's you and Cedril. As Duncan's walking around and he's looking at a giant owl bear that has been stuffed, and he's like, Oh, that must have taken quite some time to stuff there, an owl bear. Those are mighty fierce creatures. Oh, a customer. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to eavesdrop. 
let you finish up your conversation. This is a fascinating store. I don't think I've ever set foot in one of these. You, so you stuff all of these creatures here? I see there's a wolf over there. There's a beaver. This owl bear right here. This is fantastic. Yes, yes. We we have we have lots of different uh different different creatures. Uh, they're all in here. They're fine. Uh, you know, I set them up. They're they're on display. Uh, they're not what they appear to be. But uh, if you have the right price, uh, we could we could maybe do business. Well, I'm constantly on the road adventuring. Oh, i have so rude of me. My name is Duncan, the Suicidally Brave. I'm an adventurer for hire, so no task too small, no feat too daring that I can't undertake. I just wanted to stop in the shop, but pardon me for being so forward, but it sounds like you and your friends seem to have some sort of quarrel or some sort of problem that you're trying to overcome. What is going on there exactly? Oh, yes, I am Cedril the Ruxt uh, tex Taxidermist. Uh, my good friend here who helps me out with, uh, with my, my animals for my, my taxidermy and all these creatures, these wonderful, wonderful creatures, he's going through some things. And what he's been bringing me lately is, is, well, it's garbage. It's not what he used to bring me. He used to bring me so many better things. He's stuck on this maiden female, the fair Elaine, and, uh, he wants to get her attention, but he, he doesn't have the, the chops. He's not exactly one for reading and writing. He's more of a, a, a hunter prey animal. So I, if only I could get some kind of a, a love letter to her, write it as if it was coming from him, that might be a way to get her noticed. And then I'll have more great animals to stuff. Hey, you wouldn't. You wouldn't want to run an errand for me, would you? I'll make it worth your while. Hmm. Well, I don't see why not give me a chance to see the town a little more. I'm always constantly on the road. It's nice to visit a town and get to see the sight. So you want this letter delivered, I suppose? Yes. Hold on one second here. Let me let me write something real quick here. My dearest fair Elaine, your hair is like sun glistening on a beach at dawn. Oh, that's good stuff. Uh, your skin is as milky as the freshest milk from the milk cow. Oh, this is juicy. Uh, one of these days, I shall grasp your hand, and we shall roll around in the meadow. Oh, this is incredible stuff. Uh, just I gotta bring it home here. Roses are red, violets are blue. Uh... I'd like to make out with you. Signed, Biff the Hunter. Oh, well, that was a lovely bit of poetry. I think this is perfect. All right, let's fold this up here, seal it with this wax stamp. And now this is going to be very, very important. Her father is, um, he's a bit problematic. There's some history there. The father ended up stealing the land away from the hunter's family ages ago. Oh, no. And there's been awful. bad blood ever since. Now, whatever you do, make sure that the father does not find this letter. The fair Elaine will be going down to have her hair done at the hair salon locally. Uh, she mm. she usually gets it treated around this time with, with butter, uh, which makes it mm. shine really nice. Um, make sure that you get it and slip it in under the door after her father drops her off. Make sure that he's left before you do so, or ooh, I hate to think of what could happen. So Duncan will take the letter and carefully slip it into a inside vest pocket, and he says, No problem, I will deliver this letter, and we'll have Biff and Elaine wed in no time. Excellent. And if you complete this task, I have something very special for you as a prize. All right, very good. And I'm off! <laughs> Right, so what did you think of our uh, little role play there? Your opportunity <laughs> to get to embody Cedril. That was interesting. Do you think Cedril will be making any appearances on Chad of Fallout 76 podcast? I don't think so. <laughs> oh, darn. No Rakshasas in Fallout. No. Fair enough. Well, as we're starting to head into our final thoughts section here of the show, overall, what did you think of your experience of being on Sidekicks and Sidequests? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. Do you think now that you've had the opportunity 
opportunity to create and embody a character do you think maybe trying to play Dungeons and Dragons might be something you'd like to try in the future either with your castmates or just anyone in your local area yeah I think we might give that a go with the cast I think that would be funny one night Let me give you the soapbox. Is there anything you would like to plug and tell people where they can find you on the internet? Sure. If you like ridiculous stories with memorable characters and interesting storylines, you can find Chad a Fallout 76 story on every podcasting platform that you can think of. You can also find the direct links to them on our website, fallout76podcast.com. We stream gameplay Wednesdays and Friday nights thereabouts. This is Kenneth Vigu, and it's been a while since Kurt and I had a chance to sit down, and a lot has been going on. Firstly, we wrapped Season 1 and kicked off Season 2 with our first Machinima that debuted at QuakeCon at Home at the invitation of Bethesda that sets up the story this year. We've also finalized Episodes 2 and 3 of Season 2 now, which is a two-parter epic I call The Sickle Man Is Here. And we have some special guests joining us for those episodes. Fallout lore master Oxhorn is voicing a new character. Plus, Bethesda's Pete Hines returns to reprise his role from Bethesda Game Days, The Judge. We also are joined by YouTuber KevDewitt and Twitch streamer Tooniversal. Those two episodes will have you reeling as we finally start to get answers on what is really going on in Appalachia. I'm also working on a global super stream for St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital next month. December 14th to the 20th, over 200 streamers and content creators from throughout the community, big and small, will be streaming for Fallout for Hope, an initiative that sees us as one community, in one voice, do something amazing to raise money for the cause. We're going to be hammering Facebook, Twitch, and YouTube with the hashtag Fallout for Hope. So we hope that you'll catch those streams. We have some surprise guests and unique action planned that week. Talk to you soon. Awesome. And people can find you playing Fallout 76 on PC. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Well, thank you so much for being a guest. It's such an honor to have another podcaster and can't wait to see what more is going to happen in the Chad storyline and uh, would love to have you guest again and make up another NPC. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you for listening to this episode of Sidekicks and SideQuests. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcast, Google Play, and Overcast, or feel free to save the RSS feed to use the app of your choice. Visit our website, https colon forward slash forward slash sidekicksandsidequests.com for links, write-ups of the NPCs, and to learn more about the podcast. To stay up to date and share your fan creations, you can like and follow the podcast on social media by searching for at Podcast on Facebook and Twitter. The podcast is also on Reddit, so join our subreddit community at r slash Podcast to share your art, stories, discussions, and commentary. If you'd like to hail the bard, send an email to sidekicks and sidequests, all one word, at gmail.com. I ask that you please leave an honest review on iTunes to help spread the word about the show. Sidekicks and Sidequests is unofficial fan content permitted under the fan content policy, meaning I'm not approved or endorsed by Wizards. Portions of the materials used are property of Wizards of the Coast. Copyright Wizards of the Coast LLC. Thank you for your support, and I'll see you at the pub next time. Bar to rock on one, two, one, two, three, four! Four! Psychics, psycho